Hello everyone! If you're here, I'm assuming you either watched my last video or found this video in a search to learn more about the atom. Well, in either case, you are about to be served up with some chemical knowledge on the microscopic level, as well as a small history lesson along the way. So today, we're going to talk about the atom and some models of the atom that have existed and some experiments that disprove the accepted models. Here's the lecture guide for this video in case you want to prepare subtitles for your notes ahead of time. Let's stop wasting time and begin! We'll start with a basic description of the atom as we know it today. At the center of an atom, which is mostly empty space, there is a dense region of positive charge. This body is known as the atomic nucleus and houses the protons and neutrons, known collectively as nucleons. So how exactly did we find out about this nucleus, especially in the early 1900s when microscopes were so primitive to today's standards? It took a brilliant experimental plan known as Rutherford's Gold Foil Experiment. In the lab Rutherford oversaw, a sheet of gold was hammered very thin. Uh, as you'll know later in the course when we talk about the periodic table, gold is a metal and is thus very malleable, which is to say that it can be flattened into sheets very easily. Uh, when I say thin in this case, I mean as thin as just a few atoms thin, if that. So um, we're talking about something that's probably much thinner than you've ever seen in your normal everyday life. So uh, this foil was then suspended in the center of a phosphorescent screen, and using just a small sl slit in the screen, a beam of alpha particles, which are just helium nuclei, which is plural of nucleus, um, helium nuclei alpha particles were positioned in such a way that they struck the gold foil. The phosphorescent screen would light up as the alpha particles struck it. The researchers found that most helium nuclei, about 9,999 9 in 10,000, went through the gold foil unaltered. What happened to the other one in 10,000? It turns out that this one was reflected by something in the gold foil. They had found the nucleus, but they didn't know it at the time. The current atomic model of the day was the plum pudding model, and that led them to expect that the alpha particles would travel right through the foil, only slightly altered, if at all. You can understand their surprise when this was not the case. This ultimately led the researchers to conclude that the atoms are mostly dense, uh, are mostly empty space with dense clusters of mass in their centers. Uh, we will be talking about the plum pudding model later in this lecture. Uh, but for now, we know what the nucleus is and how it was found, but there are still more parts to an atom that we should explore. Uh, in particular, I am referring to what is known of as the electron cloud. The electron cloud is the region of space outside the nucleus that takes up most of the atomic volume. The perception of the cloud has grown over time, but for now, all you need to know is that the cloud contains electrons which are negatively charged particles much smaller than both protons and neutrons. The degree to which this cloud can be distorted leads to some interesting observations that we will look at later in this course. So, it's time I stop bogging you down with the qualitative stuff and let you learn about the numbers. So, first, we will define a very special value of an atom, its atomic number, known formally as capital Z. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom, and each unique atomic number corresponds to a unique element. For example, Z equals 1 is hydrogen, Z equals 2 is helium, Z equals 3 is lithium, and so on. So, now I'd like to test you on what we've learned so far. Using this periodic table I provided, find the atomic number of silicon. We'll learn how to use this table more in the future, but for now, we'll just use it for this. So, hopefully you said that silicon has an atomic number, Z is equal to 14. Uh, you should have found silicon right beneath carbon. Uh, when I listed it on the slide, I put the atomic symbol of silicon so you could find it easier. Anyways, if you had Z is equal to 14, you were right. Good job. We're going to move on to the next topic now, but if you are still confused or have questions, leave them in the comments section below or send me an email. My address will be in the video description and at the end of this video. Now that we know what the atomic number is, it's time to include neutrons in the mix. The sum of the number of protons and neutrons is equal to the mass number, which is known as capital A. There are a few ways you can see atoms represented, as seen here. In the first, we have a capital X, and behind it we have a superscript of A and a subscript of Z. A represents the mass number, and Z represents the atomic number. X can just represent any atom, any kind of element, as long as the uh, Z value is the correct value for that element. 
Uh, the other format shows X dash A. X represents the atom and A represents the mass number of that atom. Uh, there's less to screw up on here because you also don't have to check for Z. Um, X implies that there's a specific value of Z. What we've learned so far leads us to our first set of equations in this course. The first one, P equals Z, is equation 2.1, and A minus Z equals N is equation 2.2. I would recommend writing these down somewhere, as well as any other equations we stumble across. I would, rec I would put them all on a separate piece of paper so that you're less likely to lose them in your notes somewhere. With these equations in hand, we're going to have a short five-question quiz. Please pause the video to find the P, N, Z, and A for each of these atoms listed. A periodic table is given for reference. Are you finished? If so, at the end of this video, I would like you to send me your answers in a separate file so that they may be graded over email. It's not required, but if you would like to know what you would score, it is very handy. The final part of this short lecture involves different models of the atom throughout history. We'll begin with Dalton's solid sphere model. This model was proposed by Englishman John Dalton in 1803 and made the large assumption that atoms are indivisible and that atoms of different elements differ from each other. He essentially postulated that atoms were spheres, and he was not entirely wrong. Unfortunately, problems arose with this model and it was replaced. Dalton's model was accepted for more than 100 years until in 1904 when physicist J.J. Thompson proposed his own model of the atom known as the Plum Pudding Model, named after the fancy dessert dish in his home country, England. The Plum Pudding Model theorized that atoms were large areas of positive charge with negative charges spread throughout them in small clusters, much like small clusters of raisins in plum pudding. It wasn't until seven more years had passed that, in 1911, Rutherford, after his famous experiment, proposed the nuclear model. The keystone of the nuclear model is that there is a dense, positively charged nucleus at the center of every atom, and that electrons orbit around this nucleus. This was the shortest-lived atomic model, since it couldn't account for why the electrons orbited the nucleus, and if they did so at different degrees of distance. Luckily for us, Niels Bohr was around to provide an explanation for where Rutherford had none. Bohr kept the idea of a central nucleus, but then did something crazy. He split electrons into different energy levels. Energy? In the study of matter? What kind of tomfoolery was this? But it was true, and still is true, that certain electrons have more energy than others, particularly those further from the nucleus. His planetary model was the answer to the lacking explanation, and is still often used today as nice logos for chemical companies or for basic models of atoms. Each energy level can store two electrons, then eight, then 18, etc., uh, each different orbit that you will see in a diagram represents a different energy level. So what I mean with this is that the first one holds up to 2, the next holds up to 8, and so on. You may be asked to draw an Adams Bohr model one day, so it's important to know these numbers. There is yet one more model to learn about, but it's just so important and widely accepted that it'll have to wait until later in the course when we'll do two whole lectures on it. But for now, let's get some practice with Bohr models, which are sometimes called Bohr diagrams. So, we're going to start by drawing the hydrogen 1 atom. Start with a small circle and putting Z followed by a colon and A followed by a colon. A is equal to 1 and Z is equal to 1 in our case. Um, this particular, I'm going to get ready to use a word you probably won't know until the next lecture. This particular isotope of hydrogen is known as protium. So anyways, we'll put the 1s in right after the colons and now we have our nucleus. The next step is to draw a slightly larger circle around that nucleus. Then draw a very small circle on that ring. Uh, you can see my example right there. I drew it earlier before recording this. Uh, I'd put a little minus sign in the little circle that we drew on that ring to indicate that it's an electron. You may also put to choose the symbol E minus, which is what I did. Uh, that just symbolizes that it's an electron. It's important to note that in Bohr models, Electrons in the same energy levels should be drawn as far apart from each other as possible. Here are some examples to show what I mean. Notice how the electrons are distributed in these krypton and neon Bohr models. Electrons repel each other because they have like charges. They don't like being pushed up against each other when they don't have to be. 
We'll finish up today with a challenge problem. I want you to draw a Bohr model for the neutral carbon-12 atom. List its Z, P, N, and A beneath your model. I'll give you a hint. This atom is going to be neutral, so you want the number of electrons in your shells to be equal to the number of protons in your nucleus. So take a few minutes to do that and submit your answer in the form of a picture to me over email. My email is trevorfordchemistry at gmail.com. I'll try to respond to all of the emails as quickly as possible. Okay, well, that's all I have for now. I hope you took some notes and that I may have been at least somewhat helpful in your endeavor to understand chemistry. As you can see here, there's a list of what we studied in this, um, in this lecture. I would like you to study all of the notes you took and be prepared for a quiz somewhere down the line. If you have any questions about any content discussed here, please leave them in the comment section below. You can also email me at trevorfordchemistry at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time when we'll discuss ions and isotopes.